and welcome to the session. Um, as you can probably guess, I am not Katrine Marcel, although that is who you have come to listen to and to and to hear. Um, I we've had some slight tech issues to begin this call, so I apologise for that. And I just asked Katrine if you could um, unmute your uh, unmute yourself or turn on your camera. Um, we will hopefully be able to start the session. Um, if you are unable to do that, ah, perfect. Um, hello, Mallory. We're hopefully just Katrina line. Katrina, yep. are you able to speak just so we can test your audio uh, and your visuals? Um, if anybody in the audience is able to hear Katrine, could you just confirm that? I unfortunately can't for some reason. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the reason is. Um, thanks very much, Tree, for letting us know that. Um, Katrine, if you'd just be able to use the chat function to let us know. Oh, I can see and hear Malaby though. Oh, interesting. Um, right. hmm. okay. Katrine, are you able to um Try one more time, just doing a re a re a hard reset. So that's doing Control Shift and R, and hopefully that will clear the system. And you've turned off your firewall, so maybe by doing that, that will fix the tech problem that we've got here. Um, apologies again, everyone, for the slight delay to this session. Hopefully, it'll only be a slight delay, and we'll get started soon. Is anyone looking at the YouTube lives? Yeah. Um, they may be, Malaby. If they are, they're probably not getting that a good show at the minute. <laughs> but hopefully we'll resolve this. Um, um, Katrine, if you can hear me, uh, Jacinth has suggested uh, that um, you... Do uh, uh, you turn off full screen if it's on? And hopefully by turning off full screen, uh, that will um, help resolve it. Because um, Jacinth had the problem when she was in split screen. Otherwise, if you just make sure other tabs are closed that might use the camera or mic, just shut them down. Um, Um, I'm, again, really sorry to everybody that's taken time out of their day um, to have a problem with the tech here. Um, Katrina said, does do have a full screen on and have closed other tabs. Um, I think, Lawrence, that is what we've been trying, turning on the camera on and off has happened. Um, yeah, okay. again, to you, Katrina, I apologize. I, I, we've not had, we've not um, had this specific uh, issue before. Um, the thing that I'd ask you to do if you've not already done it is trying that method we talked about before and doing control shift R and hopefully that'll um, bring you back on. Or if you have another browser program, trying that. Again, to the people that are joining, apologies for this, hopefully, slight delay. We're just having a slight 
tech issue, um, whether you're in Remo or watching us on YouTube, um, hopefully this will be resolved. Um, Katrina's just um, left to hopefully rejoin with it being fully working. Um, while we um, hopefully just uh, are filling this silence before everything falls into place and works, um, if people want to um, comment in the uh, chat any of the other sessions that they've been to today, sessions that they found particularly interesting, um, I see someone's found the React button. Um, oh, <laughs> Katrine, could you turn yourself off mute? Because we can see you now. Hello, anyone? Hello, Katrine. We can hear you and see you. Really apologize for that tech mishap to start. Um, hello. Hello? Yes. Oh, can she not hear us? Hi. Anyone there? Um, anyone there? Read the chat. You can all see and hear me now. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, good. I hope I didn't say anything embarrassing. Um, that's brilliant. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. That was stressful. <laughs> oh, some people, some people can't see in here. Okay. Um, okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Katrin. It's really nice to meet you. Nice to um, meet you. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> Beginning technical issues aside, um, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Um, I and everyone on the Thinking Economics theme, team is really excited to have you. Um, so for everyone else who doesn't know who Katrin Massa is, um, Katrin is a journalist with Dagens Nyata, a Swedish newspaper. Um, Forgive my Swedish, I don't speak the language at all. Um, in her role as a financial journalist, she has interviewed great many great economic, economic thinkers over time, and she is also a best-selling author and speaker on women's innovation. So her last her first book titled Who Cooked Adam Smith's Adam Smith's Dinner follows what the economic process of getting dinner looks like um basically how it looks like in economics but how it looks like more realistically because a lot of our economic theorization leaves out the work that women do with house care and child care and cooking and all that labor this is this falls under the broader topic of what this session about is about which is our hidden economies and our forgotten economies so um katrine was also listed as one of the bbc's top 100 women in 2015. How in one of my favorite works of hers is her sub Substack newsletter, which talks about, yes, which talks about women and wealth. And it follows the story of women and innovation and the different things in our society that the different innovations we miss out sometimes in our society because of this exclusion of female labor. Um, I have said a lot about her work and I am. Um, just going to go over a couple of things and then we would head into her presentation. So uh, first of all, there will be a Q&A session at the end of this. So if you have any questions, just type them up in the Q&A tab. You could choose to ask your questions anonymously or not. If you ask them anonymously, then I would end up reading them out. But if you don't ask them anonymously, then you would end up reading them out. Please feel free to message I or Ross or Lawrence or Ahmed if you have any issues during the presentation and we'll try our very best to get them resolved for you. Also, Katrin has a new book. It's called uh, Mother of Invention, How Good Ideas Get Ignored in an Economy Built for Men. And it's unfortunately I haven't been able to read it yet because it's not out in Canada. It's out in Sweden though and I think a bunch of parts of Europe and then it'll be out in 
it will be coming out in different languages throughout this year and next year. So um, look out for it. And without further ado, Katrin Masao, everybody. Hi, thank you so much. To, I'm so glad you can finally see me after all of that. So I guess yes. now for the next big thing, which is if going screen. Um, do you do you see my screen share? Can somebody say <laughs> say if they if they can see my screen? Like, can somebody speak? Because I can't see the chat right now. I can see a screen. How is that working? Yes, Sorry? Yeah. it's working. You can see me. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's get cracking then. So I want to talk to you about how economics forgot about women and basically why this matters and why we should uh, we should care about this. So. Um, as was mentioned, I am the author of this new book, which is called Mother of Invention, How Good Ideas Get Ignored in an Economy Built for Men. And the blue edition here, which you can hopefully see on screen, is the uh, US edition, which is coming out in, um, in October. And that's when the book will be out in Canada as well. To the right uh, is the UK edition, which is already out since two weeks. Um, I also wrote a book a few years ago called Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? Um, and I'm going to try to talk about the message basically in both of those books, trying to weave it together for you and connect it to this situation that we currently find ourselves in. Uh, I'll try speaking for about half an hour and then uh, very happy if technology is with us to, to take questions and discuss these things with you. I can't see the chat at the moment for some reason. So if there is anything like scream because I can hear. Um, um, yes, I can hear. OK, so um, I would actually like to start with this quote, which is now almost uh, 15 years old. Barbara Ehrenreich in 2008 said, with all the talk about how to stimulate it, you'd think the economy was one giant clitoris. Um, and that's obviously a comment made after the great financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, or made during this crisis. But I still think it's, it's relevant. I think it, it might be even more relevant today because we are now hopefully starting to come out of this pandemic and there is a lot of talk everywhere about how to stimulate the economy get it going again as if the you know as if the economy was this big machine that you could just sort of kick start again and in order to make my case for sort of feminist economics, which is my perspective, I want to start by talking to you about, you know, about this current crisis and why it's different. You know, we are used to think about economic crisis as something that starts in the very abstract parts of the economy. The great crisis of 2008 was obviously something that started with very complicated, extremely abstract financial products, which ended up toppling a couple of American investment banks and then spread downwards through the economy, ending up, you know, almost at the last stage, having really very real consequences to real human bodies. And that's normally the way that a crisis goes. It goes from the abstract to sort of the concrete in the economy. Now, this current uh, pandemic crisis, the COVID economic crisis, works the other way around, doesn't it? It's an economic crisis that literally started in the human body, which is um, normally a part of the economy that we don't talk about enough. 
But this crisis started in the human body. Some of the most vulnerable human bodies, you know, getting this new virus, getting ill and dying. And we ended up shutting down large parts of the formal economy because of this. And then kind of the crisis spread the other way around, you know, from the body and upwards into these more abstract parts of the economy. And I think this is worth keeping in mind. The and I think that's also why it has actually brought all of these issues that people like me have been banging on about for years, about the importance of looking at the body in economics, about talking about women's unpaid care works, about looking at health differently, and so on, to the forefront in a new way. But also because this crisis is different it's also very important that now when we are trying to solve it we are not just treating it you know as if the economy was was something that you could just stimulate to get going in the same old way again uh, because the economy is something so much more now i live just outside of London in a in a small village and during the last year seeing this crisis unfold and you know personally being you know one of the the lucky few who have not been affected you know on a very personal level by a lot of the you know very tragic and awful things that have been going on I've actually been thinking a lot about the skyline of London in terms of economics and in terms of values. Because the values of an economic era actually manifest themselves in the skyline of our cities. So take, take London, for example. So in here's a picture of, of London in, from the 1600s, and you see a skyline dominated by, you know, by big religious buildings. Because those that was where the money went, those were the, you know, the value the economy of that era, and that manifested itself in the skyline of the city. And then it changed, you know, in Victorian days, instead, you know, London's skyline was dominated by big public buildings like this one, you know, Parliament and the big, big Ben, the Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth Tower. Um, dominated the skyline along with sort of great monuments of empire, all of these things embodying the eras that that economy was all about. And then obviously in the last couple of decades, London's skyline has looked like this, you know, dominated by the great monuments of sort of financial capitalism. You know, all of the tallest buildings now are more or less banks and financial institutions. And that's been an embodiment of the values that, you know, our current era of, 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 of economy has embodied. But what I've been thinking about, of course, in the last year is that right now, most of these buildings, all of these great banks and financial institutions have been empty because of this pandemic. And to me, that has been very symbolic, just looking out onto this. And because it's like an image of that we actually have an opportunity now to, to leave this particular era of financial capitalism and the type of values that it has sort of brought with it and embodied and, um, and create and the kind of world it has created and actually try to build something new. And just that exercise of thinking about, you know, what if we, you know, rethought economics, which I know this, this conference is, is all about, you know, rethought it around other lines and around new values. What would sort of the, the skyline of our great cities look like in the future? If the greatest buildings are not going to be banks anymore, you know, not what what should they be? You know, what are the values that we want to rebuild something better around? 
And I think it's very important to recognize the current crisis for what it is. You know, it's not just about, you know, something that we can, you know, revive demand, demand in, but this is, you know, a crisis of a particular type of economy, its sources of energies, its values, its gendered and racial hierarchy, way of treating nature. And all of these things have come together into this current crisis and now it's our chance to, to build something new. So that's kind of my reading of the current moment and also, you know, why I, you know, I wanted to come to this conference and, and talk to you about the, because I do think that we are at this very crucial moment. And for me, if we are going to rethink economics, the probably most, or one of the most, you know, most important aspect of that is to bring women back into it. And I've written two books, as was, was mentioned in, in the introduction, about this problem, the exclusion of women from economics and from economic, from innovation, and what that actually ends up costing us all. And the way I normally tell the story of the exclusion of women from economics is by going back to what is actually the founding question of economics, which is this question, how do you get your dinner, which was asked by Adam Smith, the founding father of economics in his great book, The Wealth of Nation from 1776. And his very, very famous answer to this question was, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher and the brewer that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. And that kind of became the idea that, you know, economics was built from. You know, people that came after Adam Smith even talked about economics as the science of self-interest. Now, Adam Smith himself would probably have been horrified by this because, you know, his economic thought was actually more complex than this. But what's interesting is that this is sort of what we tend to take from, from Smith, this idea that the fundamental force that keeps the economy going is self-interest. And, of course, the, the question that I then in my first book, Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner, is, well, if how do you get your dinner is the founding question of economics, and it is a good economic question, um, because it is, you know, we assume that all of these things should, that there will be, the economy will go and we can go to the store and we can buy things and there will be people there who who will accept our money and all of these things will work. And, you know, it's a good question that Smith asks, what keeps all of this together? His answer was self-interest, very famously. We built sort of economic science on that foundation. Uh, but who actually cooked Adam Smith's dinner? Now, the answer to that question, which I ask in my book is, is you know, is, or it has a lot to do with this person. This is Margaret Douglas, who was Adam Smith's mother, who was a widow and looked after her son for most of her long life. And she is, I argue, the um, part of the answer to the fundamental question of economics, how do you get your dinner, that Adam Smith omits. Because, you know, for the dinner to be there on the table in front of him, him he just he doesn't just need the butcher, the brewer or the bake. Go out and out of self-interest and self-love and greed even um, create their products and sell them. He actually needs somebody to cook this dinner and put it on table. And that's someone that he omits from <laughs> economic uh, theory, almost, um, just like that, is most often a woman. And that's the argument I make in that book, that 
Adam Smith forgot about his mother and in doing that, he actually forgot about a very big and important part of the economy, which is largely women's unpaid work around care, around the household and so on. This type of work is still, as probably most of you know, not counted as part of GDP. It's not considered to be economic activity. It um, doesn't mean that it doesn't happen or that it's not necessary. It's a hidden economy. And, you know, if you try to, to quantify it, for example, just look at women's unpaid contributions to healthcare, they add up add up to, according to UN Women, to almost 2.35% of global GDP. So a very, a very crucial part of the economy that we still don't count as an economy. Uh, and that is a problem because we get a very false idea of, of the economy. And when we also also when we don't measure this type of work, it's also it contributes to us not valuing it. And this has for women all over the world, because the main reason today that women have less money than men has to do with the fact that women perform more unpaid care work or crowd in professions, you know, around care um, that are seen as low status economies and therefore they end up earning a lot less than men and the fact that we don't value and the fact that we don't measure this type of work i think goes together but that's not the only reason why this is problematic the slightly deeper question that i also ask is you know when we exclude women in this way what values do we then also exclude from the economy? And what I mean by that is that, you know, Adam Smith drew the conclusion, you know, based on the male butcher and the male baker, that what keeps the economy going is self-interest. Now, does that conclusion apply to his mother as well? It probably doesn't. Self-interest might have played a part in her spending all of those years looking after her adult son so he could write great works of economic theory um, because there were not that many e other economic options for widows in Scotland in, in those years. But I think it's fair to assume that she also did what she did out of love, maybe, a sense of obligation. You know, she worried about him. Um, she felt a sense of duty, she wanted to, um, all of these other reasons to, you know, why we do what we do in the economy every day that are not self-interest, that have to do with community, with altruism, with all of these other things. And these things were also excluded largely from economic thinking when, you know, we excluded women. So it's not just the exclusion of women, it's also the values um, and maybe the driving forces that we brand as feminine and that therefore also disappear with women. That's a problem. Because obviously these types of ideas that have been very strong in the last couple of decades, you know, greed is good, you know, let's just have everybody serve their own self-interest and automatically that will turn into the best of all worlds. Those types of ideas wouldn't have been possible without the exclusion of women from economics, because if we hadn't excluded women, then this idea of you know self-interest, the butcher and the brewer are the only thing that matters, that couldn't have taken root in the way it did. So the exclusion of women is actually bigger than women and bigger than this unfairness that it means to, to exclude so much of women's work. And this brings me to, you know, which is, it has just come out in the, uh, in the UK. It came out in Sweden, where I'm from uh, last year, and which is coming out in North America in 
in the autumn and then um, in French and German and Polish and Italian and Korean and, and some other languages next year. Exciting. And this is a book that, that deals with innovation, particularly women's exclusion from innovation and what that has meant. Um, and I wanted to do a book on that topic because I felt that my first book, Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner, very much dealt with some kind of Wall Street capitalism, which was, you know, probably what, you know, then the 2008 and 2009 financial crisis was, was about. But since then, the kind of emphasis on the economy has, or the center of gravity in the world economy has shifted, you know, from the financial sector and Wall Street more towards the tech sector and Silicon Valley. And I felt that a lot of the narratives around innovation and tech and the economy really needed a, a feminist perspective added to And that's why I set out to write this book, because I felt we've moved from some kind of financial capitalism to a Silicon Valley driven capitalism. And you know, we needed to talk about the exclusion of women from that too. And on the surface, I think this is a book that um, looks at, you know, very kind of concrete stories and projects in a way that my previous book perhaps didn't. So, you know, it starts with the story of the suitcase, you know, the economic mystery of why suitcases didn't have wheels until 1972, which is something that Nobel Prize winners in economics have and others have thought about. You know, how come that we invented the wheel 5,000 years ago, the modern suitcase in the late 1800s, and nobody came up with, you know, this rather simple and brilliant idea to put wheels on suit until the 1970s. Um, the reason actually, which I talk about in the book, and I'm not going to go into it in depth, has to do with gender. There was a very strong idea that no man would ever roll a suitcase. And even after this project was invented um, in 1972, American department stores didn't want to sell it because they thought Will ever roll a suitcase. It's unmanly. A real man has to carry. And women don't travel alone anyway. Uh, if a woman travels, it's with a man, and he must then carry her suitcase for her. Um, so actually, the answer to this classic mystery of innovation, you know, why didn't suitcases have wheels until 1972, is gender. And I start the book there in order to slowly try to um, change this narrative that innovation and technology is somehow this neutral force. So by bringing in this very concrete example of the suitcase, it's a way of showing people, hopefully, um, that things like gender, our ideas about gender, about men and women, do really kind of affect innovation. They sort of physically affect what products we invent and what business did and, and so on. So suitcases, I also talk about electric cars, you know, which is um, something that was has a very gendered history. Electric cars were invented in the late 1800s, um, but they soon became seen as feminine and ended up being marketed um, primarily to, to women. You see the, the women here in their great fancy hats getting into their electric cars. And these feminine, these associations between electric car technology and femininity, there was this assumption that electric cars, because they were more quiet, they were safer. Uh, you couldn't drive as far in them, but they were a lot more comfortable. All of these things made people assume that they were somehow for women. But that then became a commercial problem. You know, a car that had been branded feminine 
was um, many men then didn't want it. And this wasn't the main reason that we then shoved electric cars to the side and decided to build a whole world for petrol driven technology, but it, certain, it certainly contributed. And what I want to show here in the book is that even in this sort of really big technological shift that or choice that we made, let's go with petrol driven technology, uh, gender was again a, a factor. And I talk about other things like that, you know, in the book, how did bra technology take us to the moon? You know, these iconic moon suits worn by Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong on the moon in 1969, they were actually um, created by a company specialized in female bra production uh, because they were the only ones with the techn technological skills to this problem without dying. Um, um, and it, it was through the technology of sewing that, you know, we actually managed to, to do this. You know, these has, suits were hand sewn by female seamstresses specialized in, in bra production. Um, so this is one of the stories I tell in the book, you know, also to talk about how certain things are not perceived to be technology like like sewing is associated with women in in large parts of the world and therefore we do not see it as technology in the same way and one of the arguments i make in the book is that technology has consistently been defined throughout history as what men do we talk about the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. That's how we teach it. Um, but we could talk about the Weaving Age or the Pottery Age. But the problem is that technology that has to do with, with weaving and cloth or with ceramics is technology more associated with women. And we don't see it as technology in the same way. And all of this creates this narrative of innovation that where it looks great innovations that have sort of driven our economies forward have been created by men. It's obviously not true. I mean, today we spend a lot of time trying to attract women into STEM fields and tech. But we forget that, you know, the first programmers in the world were women. Women basically invented software. Uh, and this was just, you know, a couple of decades back. Book, Mother of Invention, this is what I am trying to show, is how ideas about gender shape technology and shape innovation, and how that in turn has the huge economic consequences for women. So programming was a, was a profession that used to be female dominated. My mother was a, was a computer programmer actually still when dominated in, in Sweden. And then it shifted and it became perceived as, as male and salaries increased, status increased. And this is something I explore in depth in how something men come in something starts to be perceived as technical if something is perceived as technical it dictates that it would be high paid and that's sort of one of the mechanisms behind this strange phenom phenomenon of how status and high pay so often seem to follow men in the economy so our definition of technology and what's technology and what's innovation and the way we basically say that the technologies associated with women, the innovations associated with women and done by women, innovation are not technology, that ends up also having very real sort of labor market consequences for were professions and tasks that that men specialize in for reasons became perceived as technical 
and what women have been good at or or specialized in we tend to natural you know and if a skill is then the economic logic dictates why should we pay somebody very well to do something that only comes and just to to end um so mother of invention is all about this you know showing that technology is not this neutral force that's sort of pushing everything in front of itself because i think that's a very dangerous narrative that we've sort of certainly have heard in the last couple of decades that you know technology and come along and we, all we have to do is adapt we have to adapt our labor markets we have to adapt as humans and our societies need to um and that's plain wrong i mean technology is not a neutral it's something that we create we come into it with all of our ideas about gender and race and um and fairness and unfairness and all of that becomes embodied in the technology we create and this narrative presenting innovation and technology as something new um that is also the narrative that that can legitimize a lot of the the things that we've seen in the last couple of decades you know tech companies not paying taxes you know tech billionaires uh, not feeling that they have much responsibility for the wider society and so on so i do think it's sort of a core narrative to to challenge and i am trying to do this from a feminist perspective in this book mother of invention but i want to end where i started with this idea which i think is also uh, key in my book who cooked adam smith's dinner that adding women back in actually changes the whole story because that was certainly the case with mother you know when we add margaret douglas back into the um, you know in, into economics we don't just add women back in in the name of fairness but actually the whole nature of economics changes it can't just be this science of self interest that it became thanks to the exclusion of women and all of the things that we for different reasons have branded as female and it's the same with adding women back into the history of innovation because it changes the whole story we tend to think about you know the beginning of of innovation something like this you know we were these hairy apes walking around on all fours and one day we got up and somebody probably a man grabbed a big stick and maybe he sharpened it into a a spear or something and that was the first innovation it was a hunting tool uh, we just assume this um and in this story our will to innovate our will to create new technology is intimately tied to a will to dominate and conquer the world around us the first tool is a spear you know man directed at you know somebody else and the thing is this whole narrative is is probably not true you know we don't know what the first innovation was we don't know what the first tool was and what many historians and archaeologists believe now is that you know it might not have been a a hunting weapon it could have been this it could have been the digging stick which um is a tool uh, thought to have been invented by women and if you take this into account if you add women back into the history of innovation and the first tool is not a hunting tool but um but a digging stick um then the narrative shifts and our will to innovate is you know not as at all intimately or inevitably tied to a will to dominate and conquer the world around us i mean a digging stick is for is for digging up edible insects and roots from the ground so just like that by bringing women back into this this story 
the whole conclusion of it changes. And I think this still has economic consequences today. I mean, if the way we talk in the economy is all about disrupt, crush and dominate. That's how, how people talk at, still at startup conferences. But innovation could be about other things. It could be about, you know, repair, tend and cooperate. But these things are, you know, branded as, as female and they are not sort of part of an innovation paradigm at all. And I think this is intimately tied to how we tell this story of innovation, that this insistence on excluding women from the narrative, it makes us misunderstand the whole thing. Just like, you know, Adam Smith's omission of his mother made us sort of misunderstand economics. Um, and that's why I am so passionate about right It's about innovation or it's about economics. Because when we do, the whole meaning of them changes. And also, I also think suddenly there is so much more hope and so much more is possible. So I'm going to stop there and I hope you still hear and see me. And I'm, you know, I'm not like that professor who have been talking uh, into nothing for, for the last half an hour. Um, I'm really, really, really glad that, you know, you've come to, to listen to this and um, I have a newsletter. You can grab it on my website, katrinemarsal.com. It's all free. And then you can keep hearing from me every Thursday about these types of things. So I am that um, I'm still with you, am I? No? Hi. Yes, I, uh, you, you are here. hear or see me? I can. I can see you. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can't see myself. Oh, mm, I see you. I think. What oh about? no, am I gone again? <laughs> yes, she is gone again. Can she see the chat? Okay, you can hear me. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so, should I just look at the questions then? Um, should I do that myself? Uh, um, I can open the Q and A box or. Um, Yes, I, I, I think she's really sorry yes. about this confusion. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. Sorry. Oh, I see. I cannot hear you. I could hear you before. Can't hear you now. Okay, should I ask myself the questions? Hello? Okay. Technology is, is not with us. Um, okay, you can read the questions. Okay, great. I get to ask myself questions. Okay, so um, do you think Marx made more room for women in his understanding of political economy than Smith? Ooh, big question. No, not, um, not that much more room for, for women. I do have in uh, my new book, Mother of Invention, I have a whole chapter on Engels. Um, who did make more room for, for women, but kind of in a way that I have a little bit of a problem with. <laughs> I have a whole chapter on Engels and the first machine age. Um, and because he actually, in his book, The Condition of the... Now I can see you. Hello. Oh, Condition hi. <laughs> of the in England, um, um, he does talk a lot about the effect that the first machine age had on women and men and on gender. And I do go into that uh, quite in depth in the new book, Mother of Invention. Um, what do you, so uh, I don't think I've time to, to sort of go into that, but if you email me, um, if you want to know more about that, I'm happy to, to talk about that. Um, what do you make of Marxist feminism? I'm not sure. I don't know if I know enough about it, um, actually. Um, next. Oh, you can ask questions okay. now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the next question. So are there economic models that you feel offer an alternative? 
Yes. Um, yes, definitely. I do think, I mean, since I wrote particularly Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner, which was almost 10 years ago, um, I think a lot has, has happened. Um, and, you know, we are challenging, you know, standard economic theory, um, you know, in a whole new ways. I think that is, I mean, I'm out a lot talking or have been out a lot talking to students at universities. And I think there's, there's a lot of new thinking there. Uh, right now, I'm particularly excited around a lot that's happening around, you know, rethinking the role of nature in economic models and what's happening with the climate emergency and sort of the need, like the urgent need to develop new thinking around that is something that I'm particularly trying to learn uh, about myself at the moment. Um, so yes, I do think there are alternatives. Um, I do think they will go mainstream at a much quicker pace as well because of the climate emergency. I think there will be like a political need to do that. Yes, yes, I completely agree that you, you hear and read about a lot more articles, especially in economics, about the climate emergency. And there's a lot more growth in ecological economics as a field. So I definitely agree with you on that. Um, OK, so on to the next question. Someone says they would be interested to hear how you think the relationship between gender and innovation maps onto the discipline of economics. Does the same apply? The discipline, so, sorry, I'm not sure. How do you understand that question? I'll read it again. So they want to know how you think that the relationship between gender and innovation maps mm -hmm. into economics as a whole discipline. Okay. Um, yeah, I think if I, I think there, economic historians, I think have written more about it um, mm -hmm. um, because I think it's more natural. Um, because you look at you know technological change and also because you you study you tend to study like a particular period and a particular you know something i don't know if it's so much onto the discipline of economics i think we should you know there should be more um on it and i think i think it's almost sometimes can almost be shocking how little room it it receives I mean, one thing I talk about in the book is, for example, all of these studies we've seen coming out in the in the last couple of years around, you know, will your job be taken by a robot? Um, and how so many of these studies actually, they do point to a very gendered relationship where, uh, where a lot of male dominated fields seem to be easier to automate than many female dominated professions, particularly in care. And that will be in many of these studies coming out of economics, but it's not talked about that much. And I think just this very simple fact that, you know, our labor markets are incredibly gendered. Um, I mean, even in Sweden, where I'm from, or almost particularly in Sweden, it's a very, very gender segregated labor market. So obviously when technological forces come in, they will have very gendered effects. And this is something that Engels talked about, talks about in the first machine age. Why are we not talking about it more? So I think, you know, it should, should be much more of that perspective because I think it's, it's very crucial. Yes. Um, uh, yes, and I think that, I think that a lot of the idea of the discipline of economics has to do with, you know, how economics is, taught and how um basically with how it's taught I, i've been an economic student for many many years now and i from my understanding i haven't i haven't had i haven't received much education on a feminist economics i'll say most of what i have learned has been by you know reading myself or so you know reading the works of other feminist economics catherine catherine included and i would say that the discipline of economics is currently lacking in a lot of the relationship between gender and innovation, but there is also at the same time a movement. The I would say that economists of today have a lot more options than economists of 20, 30, 40 years ago. And you know, so I, to some extent we're heading in the right direction. But I guess we'll have to see how that works out for, <laughs> for the field. Uh, the next question is, person is seeking solutions. Should we aim to give more value to 
reproductive slash female activity or remove value from productive slash male masculine activities? And are there other ways than money to incentivize that? Yes. Oh, so that's that's the big one, isn't it? Um, big one. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, I've, I go into that in Mother of Invention, you know, um, quite a bit and trying to sort of look at you know what what can happen because also what what often happens you know if you look at economic history is that um that things that are seen as you know feminine during one period then they get to be perceived as male you know like the example of, of computer programmers uh, you know went from female to to male um you know other other professions have also sort of shifted gender throughout history and somehow also then gone from like you know low status when women did it to higher status when men did it so so it's it's complicated and i um um so should we aim to give i do think just to try to answer your question in a straightforward way give more email you know um uh activity um and and see what happens <laughs> um are there any other ways than money to incentivize that i think i think money is is underestimated when it comes to 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 incentivizing that i do think you know it's a it's a very simple thing just you know just pay people in in female dominated professions more and see what happens you know we haven't tried it yet so, we so tried it, yet. it hasn't let's, failed yet <laughs> it hasn't failed yet so so let's let's do that that's, that's what i think but i completely understand the you know the the question and it is it is something that it, that you know puzzles me too okay and th that's a that was a really good answer um so the next question and uh, i guess can we invite emma to come up and ask the question if if they if she would like if they would like sorry mm. Hi. Yes. Um, <laughs> great presentation. Hi, Emma. I can't see you, but oh, it's okay. Hopefully, hear you. Um, so, my question um, was: Do you have any thoughts on how to include women in economic thinking and history? With can, I, can anyone hear Emma? Oh, oh I can. Um, that, oh, did she lose everybody? Um, Uh. You're welcome to just read the question. Oh, okay, yes. Hi, Hi Emma. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll try to get it out quick. Um, do you have thoughts on how to include women in economic thinking without sort of reinforcing existing gender norms? So, how can we? value sort of traditionally feminine traits but without saying yes only women can have yeah. this or do this that sort of thing yeah i mean that is i mean i obviously spent a lot of time thinking about that because it's it's like becomes a thing particularly in mother of invention where you know i'm trying you know i'm trying to do this and it's how do how do you do you talk about it and I mean, I I think it's it's just you know just being very clear in in you know in the language we use, and I think you know just reading the history because one of the things that you know I think becomes really clear from from the narrative in that book is that you know what we perceive as feminine and masculine it really changes throughout history, and sometimes it can change you know very very quickly you know a couple of decades ago you know programming a computer was compared to cooking from a recipe and knitting and was like some essentialist feminine thing and now it's turned into like an essentialist male thing so I think it's just talking about how these sort of truths also in the economy shifts and how they can shift again. And there's a lot of lot of hope there. Um, I yes, so obviously it is very important not to become become essentialist. But I think also, you know, I think we should be open to people drawing different conclusions political conclusions depending on, you know, where they stand politically. You know, somebody who 
can certainly read my books and draw a conclusion that, you know, this means that we should, you know, pay people to stay at home with their kids. And somebody who was a social democrat might say, well, this means that we should raise taxes and provide affordable, you know, childcare. So I think there's also, is also leaving room for people because I believe that these this sort of exclusion of women from economics is just like a fundamental mistake. So it just needs to be fixed. And then we can have debates about kind of what to do with that. Does that make sense? Really helpful, thank you. Okay, the next question, I think we have about two more. Um, the next question is, Oh, three more, sorry. I would be interested to know what you found about patents. Do you have any figures? Perhaps an increase or decrease in women submitting patent applications is gender re recorded in patent, patent data. Patents. Yes. Yes. Um, it, yes. Um, so it's, it's changing and it's changing very um, slowly. <laughs> um, mm -hmm like extremely if you email me um you can find my email on my website i'm happy to send you studies and and all of that i don't have them here right now and just as you say as well it's i mean women used to be kind of recorded you know women recorded patents in their husband's name and so on and um there are also deeper things going on i go into them very briefly in the book which is that um Women, like the type of knowledge that women often have in many economists because of the role they've been given tends to be type of a traditional knowledge sometimes inherited from you know their grandmother you know a particular way of making cheese or or something and because it's like deemed as natural traditional knowledge it can also be harder to patent so there are also these sort of deeper deeper structures at play and it's quite interesting uh, but there is a lot of interesting work going on about you know patents and what should we have them for and what should the future of the patent system look like uh, that also deals with some of these issues around you know how inclusive it is that that could be interesting so so yes email me happy to send you some stuff okay uh, thank you um the next question is do you think you're oh that went very fast um the it was about do you think your theory of sexism contributes to the res reticence in handling the climate crisis and i guess what do you think about that having to do with mother nature being a yes. female leader Yes, thank you so much for that question. That is actually the whole conclusion of, my, of the book, Mother of Invention. Um, because uh, just as you say, um, it's, I mean, that's sort of the argument, you know, uh, gender, our ideas of gender hold back mm -hmm. and things that we feminine are, you know, branded as inferior, whether they are, you know, wheels on suitcases or electric cars or, you know, lots of other things. And the biggest thing that we've branded as as female is is probably nature or you know Mother Earth, as you say. And you know a lot of innovation around sustainability is very sort of tied up in these ideas about gender um, and just our whole sort of understanding of the relationship between nature and technology, technology as this sort of male force, you know, that should sort of control nature. Uh, does play, I argue, a significant part in many of our challenges. So yes, I um, that's there's a lot on that in um, in the book, and I, I also felt that I've only kind of scraped the surface on that. I think that's a big one. There's a question. The last question here is: Are there examples of women being introduced to this narrative in the way you propose? Well, I've tried to write a book <laughs> doing that. <laughs> writing a book doing that. Um, so I, I mean, I tried to be. Um, uh, I tried to do this. <laughs> if I've succeeded, I mean, I, you know, I, that's up to to readers to to judge. But that 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 is what I'm trying to do in Mother of Invention, is to sort of bring women back by telling stories. Um, bring them back into this narrative of innovation and by doing that hopefully challenging this you know which i believe very harmful narrative around innovation and technology as this 
neutral force, you know, and also as something just coming through these, you know, male billionaire geniuses um, who who sort of you know things we just all the rest of us just have to adapt to so so that that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to do um, um, yeah I, I think you're doing a pretty great job so far <laughs> um, yes I I'm, I'm a fan <laughs> yes um, so I have one more question but mm -hmm. that I think is the last one and it's about I basically in economics we talk a lot about there's this theme coming up on how we're driven by self-interest. And it's, to me, it's amusing because I took a, I took an environmental economics class and we talked about Garrett Hardin's tragedy, tragedy of the commons. And I know people who are economists might be more familiar with it, but for those who aren't, basically talks about how, um, if we had a shared common space, like if shepherds had a shared grazing land that each, shep each shepherd will have an incentive to add an extra sheep to their herd for the per because they will be able to reap more from this land. Like there would be an, in an individual will be driven by his own self interest to basically use up more of the grazing land than they should. And that was, he theorized that in 1967 and it was a common, it was a common thing that we taught and we learned. And in my in my class, it was given to us as a reading his book, his paper tra titled "The Tragedy of the Commons." And I found that very interesting because I was reading that and I was like, "What if they aren't though? What if there is more to this than self interest?" And I found the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who a woman who won the Nobel Prize in two thousand and nine. Nobel Prize in Economics Science in 2009, and her work basically studied long-running commons, like long-running fishing societies and long-running agricultural communities that had existed for centuries and centuries that were not motivated. The people had found a way to sustain their resources over such long periods of time through a sense of community and a sense of duty and the things we talk about. and. Here you talked about how that those same motivational factors could have contributed to who cooked Adam Smith's dinner. And it was his mother, Margaret Douglas. And by forgetting that, he left out the work that women contribute to the economy. And there's just so much of, I'm just curious as to what you think of this pattern in a lot of our more traditional economics that keeps on using self-interest as a motivational factor for basically why things are run when we have countless more and more examples of where our traditional self-interest thinking doesn't work with what exists in our society or rather it's not the only thing that exists in our society yeah i mean i just think it needs to stop i mean it's um it's just the and i think you know the the way you tell it is 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 very good as well because i think it, it emphasizes you know the difference what, what Eleanor Ostrom was doing she was like out in the real world you know she was not conducting some thought experiment oh. <laughs> in her room <laughs> <in her situation. laughs> she was you know she was out in the world looking at sort of how people were really sort of dealing with these things and I think that's you know that's the key it's sort of you can't sort of uphold this fantasy of this you know male individual without a body without a family without any feelings who's just you know um thinking of his own self-interest rational you can't uphold that if you actually step out of your office and you know go out into the real world and i think that that's what you know economics needs to do much more i think it's already doing it yes. i think it was worse back in the day so I think it's worse now. um and um and yeah it just it just it just really needs to stop and i i do think the pressure now from the climate emergency really puts the pressure on to develop you know real theories real you know different types of models because we will need them um and i think that will that will be the change we need Okay. Well, I, said, I said so during the last crisis as well, so I might be wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, this one, this we don't need. We don't need like the same pattern of there's a crisis, we handle it wrong. It's it's old. We're tired. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, oh, one more question came in. But that has to be the last one. Um, it says so. Then, 
a model based in social economics is better to achieve what you propose? I think so. I think, you know, just the the acknowledgement that, you know, economics is a social science and, you know, and go out in the in the real world and, you know, do things differently and um, I think I think a lot will will come from from that, and I think also you know just just include women back in. It's not you know it it does change a lot uh, of of the narrative then, and it, it makes you sort of. I mean, I think I, I talk about that in Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner that you can't just add women and stir, and that's what's so great about it. You sort of add women back in, and the whole thing changes because the whole thing is so often based on the exclusion of women or by things we have branded as 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 feminine and um and i think sort of so i think a lot can be achieved by just sort of fixing that mistake because it will you know will change so many other things okay thank you so much for answering all our questions um this was a lovely presentation. Thank you so much for being here, Catherine. And um, yes, her book, Mother of Invention, it's out in some parts of the world. It's not out in all. It came out in the UK two weeks ago. It's out in Sweden. Find it. It has basically a lot of what she talked about and more. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone, for taking out of your day to come chat with us about our economy. Uh, it's been lovely to have you and thank you for your comments. Thank you for sticking here and have a lovely day. Thank you so much. All right. Um, oh yes, you can stay in the Remo rooms. If you're, if you're streaming on Remo, you can stay in the Remo rooms and have a chat about the presentation if you want. Bye.